Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The dentist preparing to do periapical surgery should acquaint himself with the options available in designing a flap and the advantages and disadvantages of each flap design. To do this, he should make a thorough clinical and radiographic examination of the area. There are three main types of flaps, the semilunar, the scallop flap, and the full mucoperiosteal. The former two require an incision through the attached gingiva, while the latter reflects the tissues from the free margin. Demonstrated today will be some of the disadvantages seen in improper flap design, such as scarring and dehiscence. Also, we'd like the viewer to note some of the types of suturing we use with each separate flap design. The semilunar flap is the easiest flap to design. There are two types of semilunar flaps, the simple and the modified. Seen here is the simple semilunar flap. It is made in the attached gingiva, three millimeters or more apical to the greatest depth of the gingival sulcus. It extends from the distal of the adjacent tooth to the mesial of the other adjacent tooth. It has certain advantages because it is simple and quick. It does not involve crowns with questionable margins. Should the patient have an overhanging crown, an open margin, or gingivitis, the area of the incision will not involve these areas. There are some disadvantages which include repositioning is difficult. This is because the incision is usually too long or too shallow. Dehiscence formation may occur if the incision or suturing is too close to the marginal gingiva. If the labial or buccal cortical bone is missing over the root, a dehiscence may also form. A defect such as this will require a periodontal sliding flap to repair it. Scarring. This occurs when a horizontal incision is made in the gingiva. As you can see here, this is not aesthetic especially if the patient has a large smile exposing the attached gingiva. Many times a modified semilunar flap design is utilized to include the frenum, as seen here. Repositioning this flap to its former position is a lot easier. The same disadvantages of dehiscence formation and scarring seen with the simple semilunar flap is seen with the modification also. The scallop flap is similar to the semilunar flap in that it's made through the attached gingiva. The incision again is made three millimeters or more apical to the greatest sulcus depth. It extends the full extent of each adjacent tooth. Its advantages include that it does not involve crowns with questionable margins. Repositioning of this flap is simple. Simply replace the points of the flap back to the point from which they were reflected. Suture them with interrupted sutures from the point of the flap to the attached gingiva. You'll note that the flap is adjacent to the papilla causing less stress on the gingival tissues covering the labial surface of each tooth. Scarring will occur, but it will occur in the contour of the attached gingiva. The vertical incisions will not scar since these incisions on the gingiva produce little or no scarring. Better access is achieved with the scallop flap than with the semilunar flap. This is because of the vertical incisions. You'll find it's especially significant in teeth with very long roots. The main disadvantage to the scallop flap is dehiscence formation. If the incision is too close to the marginal gingiva or if the cortical bone is missing over the root, then a dehiscence may form. Now you're going to see an actual case of designing and reflecting a scallop flap. You'll also the flap, see the flap sutured back into place. All right. We're going to be doing the surgery on tooth number nine. And all these anterior teeth contain crowns. Anytime there's a crown with a questionable margin, as for example on tooth number nine, or where we have some gingival problem, a little bit of gingivitis as a result of that crown being in place, uh, we always risk the chance, if we lay a full mucoperiosteal flap, of 
producing some gum recession and ultimately showing the edge of that crown. So what we're going to do in this case is reflect a scallop flap, in which case we'll make an incision in the gingiva itself, in the attached gingiva. We'll note the gingival sulcus is probably about two millimeters around these teeth. Well, this is a ponic right here. So we'll go about five millimeters up from the edge of the gingiva to make our incision. And our scallop incision will be in the contour of the gingiva so that any scarring that does occur in the gingiva itself will look a little bit more aesthetic. We remember now that horizontal incisions on the gingiva do produce scarring, whereas vertical incisions on the gingiva do not. Let's swab again. All right. We'll start by making our scallop incision. And I think I'll start right here. We're going to pick up the frenum. We're going to make this in the contour of the gingiva itself. See, contour of the other section, please. Over the other side, Karen. All right, and we're going to make an incision. around the, all right. Now the incision is in the contour of the, the gingiva itself, as we can see here. You can see a little bit of hemorrhage here, sort of outlining that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to place a couple pieces of gauze here between the patient's teeth and let her just bite down on this. Now open just a little bit again. Okay, now bite together. And that'll tend to relax your jaw a little bit better and pick up any of the uh, excessive hemorrhage that we may have here. I'm going to place a vertical incision at each end of our, can't see. At each end of our semilunar incision. Now in this particular case, we're getting a little more hemorrhage than we would normally expect. And I feel the reason for that is that we have this bit of mild gingivitis along the bridge work and we're going to place a vertical incision right here. All right, now may I have the periosteal elevator, please? All right, we'll loosen up the tabs of our tissue here with the small end of our periosteal elevator. All right, we want to work our freedom loose. the edges of our flap loose now. I'm going to start reflecting the flap with the large end of the 
periosteal elevator. Uh, the patient will probably experience a lot of pressure because we're doing a lot of pushing and tugging here. And I find that the frenum here is a little bit more tightly attached. Right. Here is the scallop flap sutured to place. The way uh, we're going to leave the patient, we're going to dismiss her for a week. Yeah, I think that's a real good view of it. The full mucoperiosteal flap requires the complete reflection of the attached and unattached gingiva in the area of surgery. Any defects that may be present near the cervical of the crowns of these teeth will be clearly visualized. This flap is divided into a triangular design and a rectangular design. Seen here in this graphic is the triangular design. It includes the gingiva covering the full extent of each adjacent tooth to the area of surgery and it includes only one vertical incision. This design is most, the most common mucoperiosteal flap used. It's usually used on single teeth surgery with average root lengths or on posterior teeth. The rectangular full mucoperiosteal flap differs from the triangular design by the addition of a second vertical incision. This graphic shows the full rectangular mucoperiosteal flap. This design is preferred when multiples of teeth are done or when more access is desired, as in a case where there's excessive root length. This flap is used mostly on the lower incisor teeth. The advantages and disadvantages of the rectangular and triangular flaps are the same. The advantages, first of all, we have minor scarring since the vertical incisions do not tend to scar. There's no dehiscence formation. If there is a defect in the labial bone over the root, the entire flap is replaced over it. In this way, the line of the incision is not seen, as in the previous case. Repositioning also of the full mucoperiosteal flap is very simple. The disadvantage of this flap design is that it does involve the marginal gingiva, where crowns have questionable margins, or when there's gingivitis or periodontitis. In these cases, the gingiva may recede following healing, exposing the root surface or the cervical margin of the crown. The patient should be made aware of this prior to surgery, as in some cases, it may mean the replacement of the crown for aesthetic reasons. The advantages of this flap far outweigh the disadvantages. We currently consider this to be one of the more preferable flaps to use when considered considering endodontic periapical surgery. Now we'd like you to see an actual demonstration of reflecting a triangular full mucoperiosteal flap and the flap sutured back to place. We'll start the incision along the gum line first. We'll remove the attachment We'll go directly over the midline here and distal to number eight. Okay, this papilla here is free and the papilla distal to the tooth in question is free. Distal to number eight, we're going to make a vertical incision and carry this directly up into the vestibule. And let's make sure the edge there is free. That's just fine. Now we'll use a periosteal elevator. Let me have you turn your head just this way a little bit. That's very fine. And I'll see if I can give us a good view here by retracting the lip. Take the tip of the periosteal elevator.
the small end and work the tissues free first. And we'll turn around and reflect the larger segment of flap with the larger end of the periosteal elevator. One thing. Now you notice the amount of tooth or root that's showing here. If we would have made a scallop flap and brought it across this area, this may have contributed to the formation of a dehiscence. Notice also the very small amount of bone that remains at this point to the lesion itself. This must be preserved at all costs. If this particular amount of bone is lost, then the case may fail as a periodontal failure. Here's a lesion, fairly sizable lesion that we can see perforating the cortical plate. All right. All right, here's the full mucoperiosteal flap placed back into position. When suturing, it's recommended that you use 5-0 Ethicon suture material as compared to the 3-0 silk suture material recommended for most other oral surgical procedures. The advantages of the 5-0 Ethicon suture material is that it's smaller size. The needle and the monofilament suture material will cause less trauma to the delicate flap. Note in this slide, which is sutured together with 3-0 silk, that the suture is very large compared to what was seen previously. Also, there's no wicking effect. This is usually seen with silk sutures. Oral fluids and bacterial contaminants are drawn into the flap, retarding the healing time. Note the inflammation around these silk sutures. You should be aware of the fact that the 5-0 Ethicon is a little bit more difficult to work with. Occasionally it will tangle, and other times it will unknot following the uh, patient's dismissal from the office. So you have to make sure you handle it properly. Designing a proper flap requires a thorough clinical and radiographic examination. You must consider aesthetics, especially of anterior teeth when you design your flap. You must also be aware of the anatomy, the root length, and the surgical access, especially in posterior teeth. A proper flap design is important to the ultimate prognosis of the surgical case. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.